please turn in your Bibles once again to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, we continue our study in this wonderful and great psalm. We'll be looking today at verse 4, but I'm going to read the entire psalm. And then I'll read also from Psalm 56 and Isaiah 43, just a couple of verses from there. So please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 23 and let's read together the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is Psalm 23, and now we're going to Psalm 56, and we'll read the entire chapter also together. This is what the Word of God says. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. And then finally, before we pray, Isaiah chapter 43, just a couple of verses from there. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Amen. The grass withers, the flowers fell, but the word of our God endures forever. Let us pray. Open the eyes of our hearts, O oh God, that we may be able to see the wonderful things that are found in your holy word. Show us yourself, O oh God, in your word. Show us our sin and our need of salvation. And show us Christ, our Savior. And make your word come alive to us today 
by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Hear us, O God, and pardon graciously all of our many sins because of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That is our text this morning. And I want to begin by asking you this question. What is your only comfort in life and death? I don't know if you have thought about this question ever in your life, but if you haven't, here's an opportunity for you to really think about this. What is your only comfort in life and death? Well, generations before us, there are people of God who wrestled with this very question. And as they searched the scriptures, they came up with an answer that is recorded for us in a document that is called the Heidelberg Catechism. And question one, so this is what they, how they answered this question. The question again is, what is your only comfort in life and death? And listen to the answer that they came up with, uh, informed by the scriptures. That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yes, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Now that's a very long answer. But I find it very helpful that I belong to God. And that is my greatest comfort, that I am his. I am his treasured possession because of the merits of Jesus Christ, my Savior. And because I belong to him, he then will take care of me. I matter to him, not because of any virtue or any value in and of myself, but because of the value and the virtues he's put in me through Jesus Christ, because of the righteousness that has been imputed to me by faith, by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, that makes me special before him. I am his child. I belong to him and to borrow the imagery from Psalm 23, I am his sheep. He is my shepherd. I belong to him and he belongs to me. He is mine. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his own name's sake. And yes, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That is the faith of David as he writes this psalm under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He expresses confidence in Christ, confidence in his shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a couple of things I want to mention here that will help us understand the true meaning of Psalm 23 and the structure of it. This is what we call 
poetry, Hebrew poetry. And Hebrew poetry is very different from English poetry. Usually in English, the climax is at the end of the poem. When somebody is writing a poem, the climax, we expect it to come at the end. In Hebrew poetry, actually, the climax is at the center of the poem. That's the main point of the poem. And so here, in this verse 4, we are looking at the center of Psalm 23. And here is the main point, that the main message of this psalm that David, the author, wants us to get and understand under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The center is God's presence with his people. For you are with me is a central theme of this psalm. And so you could actually read this psalm as follows. Listen carefully. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, for you are with me. He makes me lie down in green pastures, for you are with me. He leads me beside still waters, for you are with me. He restores my soul, for you are with me. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, for you are with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, for you are with me. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, for you are with me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. For you are with me. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For you are with me. Do you get the point? What makes a difference in the life of David, the shepherd who was writing, the, 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 the author who was writing this psalm as God's sheep is that God is with him and he had such confidence in him that because God was with him everything was well and he could we could picture David singing going around singing it is well it is well with my soul because he knew God was with him and if God is with us no one can be against us. If God can, is for us, no one can be against us. I want to ask you this morning, do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is with you? Do you have that confidence in you? Or is this something that just is an intellectual knowledge that you have, but doesn't really make any difference in your life? The way you live your life, the way you go about your business every day, the way you relate to other people, the way you, you serve, the way you conduct your life as a whole. Is there enough testimony in your life to say, to show that you know, that you know and you know and you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God's presence is with you? Friends, this is what God has taught his people over and over for generations before and now. And this is what God will always be for his people. And he will be always with his people. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God's presence makes all the difference in the life of his people. We know he walks with us. He talks with us. And he tells us that we are his own. And we have a joy that we share that other people who don't know him cannot, have not yet tested, have not experienced. And so with David then, we can say, even though I walk 
through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you are with me. Now, if you have been following the progression of this psalm, there's something very interesting that is worth noting here that is happening. First of all, you see in verses 1, 2, and 3, there's more of an, a, a jubilant excitement. He, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside sea waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then he comes to talk about an experience that is just as real for God's people, and yet sometimes we don't like to talk about it so much. In verse 4 he says, Sometimes I find myself walking through the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, life in Christ, life with God, is not all rosy. There are times when Life with God, even as believers in God, as the sheep of God in Christ, life gets hard for us. This is contrary to a lot of what you hear in modern day pulpits. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and all your problems will end. Actually, the truth is much more closer to the opposite. The Bible says, all who seek to live a godly life will suffer. There's a kind of suffering that we, we as Christians experience simply because we are Christians. And the moment you become a Christian, it's like you've been drafted into a battle. There's a war going on between the powers of darkness and the powers of light. Because between God and the devil. And sometimes you are at the battleground. And life sometimes gets harder the, the more you grow in Christ, the more you serve him. How, what are we to do in those times? Are we to just abandon the faith and go back to our old life? No. We are to have steadfast faith in God who is ever committed to us in Christ. He's bound himself to us. And he's not only promised to be with us, he is for us. I want you to really pay attention to this. I'll say it again. God is not just with you. He's for you if you are one of his children in Christ. We read from Psalm 56, verse 9. There the psalmist says, This I know, that God is for me. And if God is for you, what is there to fear? What can man do to you? And so the psalmist here is giving us a very realistic picture of what it means to follow Jesus. That it's not just going to be, every day is not going to be a Sunday. There'll be dark days, dark seasons of your life, dark experiences that will sometimes cause you to even question whether God is there or not. And some of you listening to me, watching to me, watching me right now, may be going through just such an experience. You're broken. With this COVID, your finances are tight. There's so much stress on your mind as you face the uncertainty of the future. Some of us parents are worried about our children going back to school in September. And so many other things. People have lost jobs, have lost homes. Relationships have been shattered and broken. What are we to do? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? God is with me. He's a mighty fortress. You remember uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, wrote this wonderful hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, based on Psalm 46, which says, the first verse says, God is our refuge and our strength, 
an ever-present help in times of stress. And at the end of that psalm, there's these wonderful words, be still and know that I am God. Martin Luther writes, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid flood, the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us fall. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. But as he wrote this psalm, uh, I like the, the, the faith that he expresses in God. In the last stanza, we read these words, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abides still, and his kingdom is forever. In other words, I'm not worried. If I lose everything, it doesn't matter to me. I have God, and he is all I need. Take all my goods. Take everything away from me. But you cannot take away my God. He is with me forever. And because of this, I can face another day. I can face, I can take another step moving forward. I'm never going back. I'm ever going forward until that day when he will come to take me to be with him forever and ever in his presence. Again, I want you to, so, to see something here that often we miss. You remember at the beginning of our study, I mentioned that often this psalm is considered a, a psalm to be used when somebody has died. And many pastors who preach from this psalm, I don't fault them for that. But this psalm is a psalm for life. And look at what the words are saying here in verse 4. Even though I walk through. It, doesn't mean, it, it means that I'm not trapped by these black or dark forces. I'm not trapped by these evil forces that are coming against me. I'm going to go through them. Do you remember the, the passage we read from Isaiah? When you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. Even through the fire, God says, I will be with you. I'll take you through that. And it is important for us to remember that God will at times allow suffering and pain to come in our lives in order to sanctify us and to purify us. But he never abandons us. And he will take us through those difficult experiences of our lives and bring us safely to the other side. We will walk through them. So let me encourage you, dear one, listening this morning. Whatever it is that you may be going through, however dark, however hopeless and bleak the situation might look in your life, if you have God with you, you will go through it. Trust me. And hang on. Be still and know that God is God. He will never fail you. When I was a little boy, we, I learned the song, Jesus never fails, Jesus never fails. The man of this world, ne the man of this world will let you down, but Jesus never fails. And we would go, your boyfriend may let you down, your girlfriend may let you down, but the man of this world will let you, will, 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 the man of this world will let you down, but Jesus never fails. Jesus never never fails. Your brother might let you down. Your sister might let you down. The man of this world will let you down, but Jesus never fails. Your husband might let you down. Your wife might let you down. The man of this world will let you down, but Jesus never fails. He will take you through those difficult times. I love just how David writes here. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know what a shadow is, right? A shadow is a representation of the real thing. So this looks like death and it's threatening me, but it's only a shadow of death. Why should I be afraid of it? It's nothing like just, 
it's, it's more like a pest. I just need to brush it off because God is with me. I don't fear shadows. He can deal with the real thing. And indeed, Jesus Christ has dealt with death. It's like he loves us so much. He's so possessive of us. He's so in love with us. He, will say to, he says, over my dead body, so to speak. You cannot get to my children unless you get through me first. And he did exactly that on the cross. When the devil wielded his greatest strength to destroy God's plan of salvation and bring everything to nothing. Jesus said, over my dead body. And he was crucified. He died on the cross. And the people looking on perhaps thought, oh no, that's the end of it all. He was buried, but on the third day he rose again. And we read in 1 Corinthians 15, oh death, where is your sting? Oh death, where is your victory? And so, even if God does not redeem you, rescue you from the pain and the suffering you're going through right now, and you get to a point where your life is gone, you're dead, that is still nothing to fear. Because death for us who believe in Jesus Christ only transports us into the very presence of God. And those who long for God's presence will fear nothing, not even death. Yes, death is our enemy, but it is the last enemy. The sting of death has been removed. Death no longer has power or victory over us. He rose from the grave and now he's alive. And we serve a risen Savior who is with us and he walks with us through life. He knows what it means to be human, to live in this fallen world. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And we face many enemies, spiritual enemies, physical enemies. Sometimes the struggles we face are internal struggles, or some are external struggles. God is equal to them all. He deals with them all. The sin in our own lives which threatens us finds its answer in God. The pressures that come from outside of us, pressing on us, giving us so much pain and stress, God deals with them all. The physical suffering that we go through at times, God is the answer to that as well. And the spiritual dangers that we go through in this life, God answers that too. As we come to a close, let me just point out a couple of things at the end of this verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now you may be scratching your head to think, how does a rod and a staff bring any comfort? You'd actually be thinking maybe the contrary. But for any shepherd worth his sort, these are very important tools, a rod and a staff. A rod is used for discipline. And a staff is used for defense. Disciplining the sheep. Because sometimes the sheep will want to wander off into dangerous territory. And the, the shepherd uses his rod to bring them back. Doesn't God do that with us? He disciplines those whom he loves. And so sometimes when we wander, as we are prone to do, remember that hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That is our nature as human beings. We sometimes wander, and God in his love and mercy as our good shepherd who uses his rod of correction to bring us back. And also, he will use his stuff to comfort us. Because he cares for us. 
His staff is used to fight against our enemies because our enemies are also his enemies. And because of this, we have nothing to fear but only to trust in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for ministering to us this morning. Your word is sweet to us. Thank you for the reminders we've heard this morning. Oh, Lord, we pray that you strengthen our faith. We believe, but help our unbelief. And help us to walk each day of our lives, to go through each day of our lives, each experience of our lives with such confidence that you are with us as you promised, even to the end of the age. Bless us, we pray, and make us a blessing to others and forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.